it's our pleasure to open this one day conference titled Global Anti Gender and Anti LGBTQ Plus Politics Historical Continuities, Transnational Connections, Contested Futures. Today's conference is the conclusion of a series of workshops uh, commenced in May of this year that together analyze the recent rise of anti gender and anti LGBTQ plus politics as a global phenomenon. We focus primarily on the Central and East European context in our first two uh, events. Today, we extend our ge geographic scope. Um, and as a quick note, um, our earlier discussions from May are available on YouTube. Um, you can find these uh, and links to these on the uh, conference page. So my name is Roy Kimmy, and I am one of the co-organizers of today's event. Uh, I'm a social and cultural historian of 21st, uh, 20th and 21st century Eastern Europe, uh, and I'm presently a teaching fellow in the social sciences here at the University of Chicago. Good morning. My name is Misha Apoltova. I am the second co-organizer of this conference. I am, like Roy, uh, a uh, historian of East Central Europe, uh, particularly the 20th century socialist period. So uh, again, uh, thank you all for joining us today, uh, whether in person or over Zoom. Uh, we especially thank our presenters and panelists, many of whom traveled um, across states and across borders uh, to join us here today. Um, we thank two our discussants and chairs for their thoughts and thoughtful commentary. Uh, we're truly pleased to be here with you today. Um, so across three panels and a keynote lecture, we will undertake a comparative global analysis of right-wing populist and religious anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus movements, from campaigns calling for textbook bans in Florida uh, to the removal of accreditation of academic programs and gender studies in East Central Europe to men's rights movements in India. It feels both incumbent to enumerate, uh, incumbent upon us to enumerate recent expressions of anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus politics, uh, and to pay careful attention to the ways that these movements converge and diverge locally and globally. Today's papers consider these local and global aspects, as well as address their material, institutional, and discursive networking. The actors in these networks uh, mobilize publics through affectively charged uh, strategies. Regularly and somewhat uh, counter counterintuitively, uh, they recast the terms language, uh, strategies of liberal and progressive politics, and particularly um, human rights and democratic participation. To take but one example, uh, to these activists, uh, sex education is a form of uh, uh, abuse and thus a violation of the rights of children and of parents. Guaranteeing these rights requires international lobbying uh, for a new declaration of the rights of the child. Behind gender ideology, they argue, is the imperialism of uh, intellectual elites who pose a threat to the rights of parents, children, and the nation itself. What histories do these movements draw upon and create? What transnational connections and networks do they build? What is their individual and collective vision of the future? And how do we as critically engaged scholars uh, address these challenges? What kinds of moral and political reasoning do they employ? What approaches to public engagement uh, and forms of legal advocacy do these movements share? The papers today uh, engage with anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ politics from a variety of methodological and academic vantage points, um, spanning legal studies, history, sociology, anthropology, linguistics, and many more. Um, though our panels are, are arranged thematically um, to address the historical and transnational uh, aspects of this politically flexible movement, we would like to highlight a few other connections uh, between today's papers that you might uh, want to explore as, uh, as, we, as we go through our panels. So the first of, e for first of these is uh, how identity categories are reconfigured and re-traditionalized. How, for example, is masculinity redefined by this movement? How has the figure of uh, the parent to been recast uh, by anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus activists? The second is a matter of politics. How have anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus campaigns I'm sorry. 
reappropriated and redefined liberal and progressive ideas of rights, including the ideas and language of human rights. Third, uh, what is the geography of anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus, plus politics? How is the concept of gender spatialized? If anti-gender and anti-LGBTQ plus networks transcend the local in the main of their shared opposition to globalism, can we consider it as another form of globalism, even counter-globalism? And finally, uh, we raise the issue of methods. How do we understand this movement as a problem of complexity and scale? Where even do we start? How do we untangle the multiplicity of religious, right-wing, populist, patriarchal, and other discourses entailed in the movement? And how can the work of the humanities and social sciences together elaborate and law, elaborate the dynamic force of this movement? Uh, so some acknowledgements then. Um, before we begin, we would like to express our deep gratitude to um, many people who have generously supported us with their time, um, both as intellectual uh, mentors and in the difficult work of arranging a hybrid conference. Um, we would like to thank especially Professors Tara Zera and Susan Gal uh, for their steadfast guidance. We also thank Esther Peters um, from the Center for Eastern European and Russian Eurasian Studies for her indispensable and enthusiastic support, and to Matthew Wefflin for his technological knowledge and assistance um, with the conference page. Uh, this conference has been generously supported by numerous organizations and departments on campus. We would like to thank the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies, the Center for International Social Science Research, the Center for Latin American Studies, the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, the Committee on Southern Asian Studies, the Department of Anthropology, the Department of History, the Frankie Institute for the Humanities, Global Studies, the Office of the Provost, and the Posen Family Center for Human Rights. Um, I'll now open our first panel, Historical Continuities, Reframing History, Recasting the Political. Um, let me welcome our chair, uh, Angelina Ilieva, who will introduce our speakers today. Um, Angelina Ilieva is instructional professor in South Slavic and Balkan literatures in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Chicago. She holds a PhD in Slavic literatures from Northwestern University. Uh, her research focuses on national and other identity narratives in Southeastern Europe, especially the intersections of the political and the aesthetic experience. All right, with that, thank you, Agalina. Thank you, Roy, and thank you, Misha, for organizing what promises to be a, a very interesting event. Our first speaker is Lorna Bracewell. Um, She's a political theorist, an associate professor of political science at Flagler College. She received her doctorate in political science at the University of Florida in 2015. Bryce scholarship <coughs> focuses on feminist theory, the history of political thought, populist politics, and conspiracy theories, including the Canon movement. Her writing has appeared in academic journals, including Science and Frontiers in Sociology, as well as in popular forums such as the Washington Post. <clears throat> Her book, Why We Lost the Sex Wars, Sexual Freedom in the Me Too Era, recently out from the University of Minnesota Press, offers a revisionist history of the feminist sexuality debates in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. In doing so, it foregrounds the influence of liberal, concepts such as freedom of expression, the public-private divide, and the harm principle. Her paper today is entitled, This is a Work for the Mothers, Reclaiming Motherhood for the Feminist Left. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bracewell. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this very exciting um, conference. conference. <laughs> I'm I'm getting a strange echo. Should I keep talking to test it? All right. Okay, good. I didn't want to torture the people who may be there in the room <laughs> suffering. <laughs> um, so the work that I'm presenting today is actually um, a work in progress that I'm co-authoring. Um, 
with a fellow political theorist and old friend. Actually, we know each other from before either of us became political theorists from growing up in Tampa and running in kind of similar you know, bohemian wannabe intellectual circles um, there. So it's really gratifying to, you know, now be able to to collaborate in this professional capacity. Anna Daly is her name, and she's an assistant professor at Sacramento State University. Um, I think partly because of our shared connection to Florida, where I where I still uh, work and, and live, um, we were fascinated by the kind of um, what we see ultimately as a resurgence of a kind of aggressive um, right wing, radical right wing um, maternalism um, in American politics with the emergence of Moms for Liberty, which has its kind of roots right, right here in Florida, um, very near where we both grew up. And so we were kind of watching this with, with curiosity and fascination, and um, we were wanting to, to think through it together. And this uh, draft is the kind of beginnings of that effort. So I think that the, the first kind of move that we make, and this is largely uh, the work that Anna is doing, um, we try to contextualize the Moms for Liberty phenomenon um, in several ways. So the first way we try to contextualize it is by thinking of it in relationship to like other um, politicizations of motherhood that we're seeing happening in the past, you know, I don't know, 10 or so years in American politics. Because it's, once we kind of saw it in Moms for Liberty, we started seeing it, seeing it everywhere, and actually like across like the political and ideological spectrum. So, you know, there's groups like Moms Demand Action, which is a kind of progressive gun reform group that has become quite, um, you know, active and, and vocal and influential. Um, you know, the wall of moms in Portland um, during the Black Lives Matter uprisings um, in the summer of 2020 um, made a lot of headlines. And, th and there's many other examples. So we kind of wanted to think about Moms for Liberty and these right-wing politicizations of motherhood in the context of this broader um, kind of resurgence of, of politicizations of motherhood that seemed to span the spectrum. And we were, the kind of first question I guess we had was like, is this like good or bad? <laughs> to put it simply, you know, um, I think the ways in which some like, you know, I don't know, like queer feminist inclined people might think it's bad or obvious um, and maybe go without saying, right. Um, there's of course this like long, deeply patriarchal heteronormative uh, tendency to connect, you know, womanhood to motherhood or reduce womanhood to motherhood um, and, and to, you know, kind of define women purely um, in terms of their biological capacity to bring forth children and things like that. So, you know, anytime um, uh, feminists uh, who are interested in contesting patriarchy or heteronormativity are doing so through a discourse like motherhood, it's, it's dicey and it's risky. And, um, but I also ultimately think where Anna and I have have landed is that we think it's like essential and vital um, to to enter the contest over um, this 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 discourse, this rhetoric, this role. Um, so that was kind of the first question we posed: like, is is this resurgence of interest in in motherhood as a kind of potential political language, like good or bad? And I think we ultimately think it's like we're ambivalent, but we see potential. And so then the question becomes like. Um, how do we like theorize, I guess, that that potential? Um, and this is maybe where more of more of my contribution comes in. Um, I, um, as was said in my introduction, you know, I'm I'm a historian of political thought at the end of the day. And um I in my first book project, you know, what I did was kind of like go to this period in the history of feminism that nobody likes to look at or think about or talk about because it's kind of embarrassing and uncomfortable and um, see what of uh, use we could maybe like, you know, rifle through there and find um, in the sex wars. And so I'm kind of doing a similar thing here with this with this figure, Victoria Woodhull, who's a 19th century um, American suffragist. Um, she, if people know anything about her, they know she was the first woman to run for president um, before women were enfranchised. Um, so it's kind of a symbolic candidacy. But she was so much more than that. And I've been returning to just read closely Woodhull's voluminous writings, because I think she's unduly overlooked and neglected. And one of the things that jumped out to me there was how she talked about motherhood and how she connected um, 
you know, m motherhood to, to, to radical leftist, like explicitly socialist and feminist politics. And um, I was actually teaching her in uh, one of my undergraduate courses in feminist political thought, and my undergraduate students found her so off-putting for exactly this reason. Um, and that got me kind of excited and interesting, because anything that gets a rise out of, you know, a bunch of 19-year-olds, there's some potential power there. So my part of the paper is kind of like trying to theorize, like, what is Woodhull doing here that that's unique or different with motherhood? And ultimately, I think where we come down is like, first of all, Woodhull um, will explicitly talk about herself and position herself as a mother. Like she's, she's offering her like radical feminist critiques of the family, her um, kind of radical feminist calls to abolish uh, marriage and abolish the family. Um, she is making these calls and making these claims as a mother. Um, she's emphatic about that. And it seems to have like served her um, and kind of inoculate her against some of the like more obvious and easy to land uh, right wing conservative reactionary blows, right? Um, it was a way to sort of uh, gird herself against these accusations that she was, you know, you know, somehow uh, inappropriately or insufficiently feminine in doing what she was doing. So she's kind of using motherhood as this like rhetorical shield to enable her to make these really uh, radical critical claims in a, in a public way. So I think that's one thing we try to like explain and, you know, lay out like motherhood could be useful to the contemporary progressive left in this way as well. Um, and then the second thing we kind of, you know, find helpful, useful, interesting, worthwhile um, in, in Woodhull's specific feminist politicization of motherhood is the way she links maternal duty not to some of the more traditional patriarchal anti-feminist stuff that we're accustomed to seeing maternal duty linked to, right? It is not mother's duties to defer to their husbands and um, happily, gleefully uh, submit to their, uh, you know, kind of authority of their husbands and, and do all this demanding, deeply demanding care work um, unremunerate, unremunerated with a smile on their face. Like that's not maternal duty for Woodhull. Rather, maternal duty for Woodhull is fomenting, affecting feminist sexual revolution. Um, so we see like great potential in that recasting of maternal duty. Another aspect of this maternal duty component in Woodhull's thought is Woodhull is explicit. All women do not have a duty to become mothers. In fact, she thinks this ideology, right, of, of kind of biological essentialism that ascribes uh, maternal duty to all women based on, you know, whatever their 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 possession of, of a womb. She thinks it's like, literally, I mean, killing children, um, putting children's health and well being at risk. Because she says, and I, I think kind of, you know, wisely, like, not all women are well suited to this work, right? Um, and so anyway, we, we, we see there's a lot of potential in how she manages to talk about maternal duty in a way that doesn't saddle all women uh, by dint of, you know, biology or something like that with this with this set of obligations. Um, so that's kind of what we're what we're up to um, in the paper is looking to feminist history, you know, as as we put it, you know, playing the role of bandita, right? Like going back into the past, stealing what we can that might be useful. Um, and the reason we want to make sure that people understand the way in which we're appropriating Woodhull is because, of course, there's this other dimension to Woodhull's thought that some of y'all may be familiar with. Um, in addition to being a kind of influential popularized, popularizer of feminist ideas and socialist ideas, she's also a great popularizer of eugenic ideas. Um, and this, in fact, after the 1890s, when she gets chased out of America by Comstock um, and the kind of anti-obscenity crusade, um, she repudiates her kind of radical leftist feminist views and you know leans hard into this um, just deeply racist, classist, uh, eugenics project and ends her life ultimately there politically. Um, in the text we're working with from the 1870s, you can see, right? Uh, <laughs> you can see that that element in her thought that that later kind of matures and ripens and develops into this full-blown um, eugenicist stance. 
Um, we are uh, aware of that. And we are, you know, mindful of the kind of risks and uh, that, that come with trying to take on a conception or a politicization of motherhood articulated by a person who's also involved in this stuff. Um, so that kind of, I guess we end the paper back in that space of ambivalence about what are the risks? What are the opportunities? Um, is this effort to kind of reclaim motherhood um, worth undertaking? Again, I think we land on like, yeah, like the risks are worth the benefits. Because if we leave this rhetorical field uncontested, we see what the radical right is capable of doing with it. Um, so, you know, I'll kind of, I'll kind of leave it there. That, but, but I do want to just emphasize that we are open to the ways in which this project is, uh, you know, risky, and uh, you know, I'm eager to hear uh, people remind me of those those risks and those potential pitfalls because that's where Anna and I are at. Are like, we're going to have to confront those head on to ultimately uh, vindicate what we're undertaking here. So, thank you very much for your time. We on the Zoom can't hear. La la la. la 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 Huh. We heard you say ah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Da. La 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 la. Shall I try again? Okay. One more time. Our second uh, presenter is Agnieszka Graf. She's a Polish feminist scholar, writer, commentator, and human rights activist. She's currently a professor in the American Studies Center at the University of Warsaw. She's a graduate of Amherst College and Oxford University and holds a PhD in literature and a postdoctoral degree in cultural studies, both from the University of Warsaw. Graf's extensive research interests include gender studies, feminist theory, nationalism, public discourses on gender. Her work addresses transnational right-wing populist authoritarianism and its uptake of anti-feminist and anti-gender discourses. Her writing has appeared in journals, Science, East European Politics and Society, Public Culture, Feminist Studies, and European Journal of Women's Studies, as well as in numerous collected volumes. She's the author of four books of feminist essays in Polish. Her most recent monograph, Anti-Gender Politics in the Populist Moment, was co-authored with Elżbieta Korolczuk and published in by Routledge last year. Her paper today is entitled Saving the West from Itself, East Europe's Mission in Anti-Gender Imagination. Please join me in welcoming Professor Graf. Can you see my presentation now? And can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you for having me in this conference. And uh, I'm really excited um, about uh, my paper following up on Lorna's because um, uh, the feminist abandonment of motherhood it has been my claim for some years is one of the causes of the successes of the anti-gender movement. Um, one of the chapters of our book, um, which was mentioned and uh, which I'm showing to you now, um, is about uh, the capture of parents by the anti-gender movement. And I've also written a book called Mother and Feminist, which briefly um, uh, made me the target of attacks of fellow feminists who thought it was um, an abandonment of feminism, actually, to on my part, to write about motherhood. So I'm, I'm very much invested in uh, the conversation about uh, motherhood. Um, I would like to start by a dis with a disclaimer. Um, I will not um, give an overview of the anti-gender movement. Um, I'm assuming everybody here 
knows what the, an the global anti-gender movement is, um, what are its claims, aims, and major players. And so here is just a um, flash of the logos of uh, some of the major actors, including um, ones that I will be mentioning in my paper, um, traditional, Tradition, Family and Property, um, Agenda Europe, World Congress of Families. This is a vast network. It's extremely well funded and um, it would take an hour to talk about it. So I will just focus immediately on the question that I want to address. Um, and this question is about the real and imagined geography of the anti-gender movement in Europe specifically. Uh, the question I want to address is whether um, anti-gender campaigns are actually conducted in different ways in different parts of Europe, specifically is Eastern Europe different? I claim that it is. Do they have different outcomes? I claim that they do. Um, does the anti-gender discourse have a map, um, an imaginary map of Europe? And I argue that it does. And finally, um, relevant, a question that is very relevant now, I think, um, how is gender um, an issue in um, our thinking about Putin's aggression against Ukraine and also in Putin's thinking um, uh, about uh, the aggression against uh, Ukraine? Um, so I will be talking about this very specific um, issue, but before I do, I want to make three introductory points, which I think of as core insights of things that I learned uh, from our almost decade-long research on the anti-gender movement, which resulted in the book um, uh, published in Rutledge last year. And it's open access, by the way, if you want to take a look at it. Um, so the first core issue, core point, is that there is a link between anti-genderism and right-wing populism, and it's a complex link. It should not be um, reduced to um, identity. In other words, they're not the same thing. It's not that populism is the anti-gender movement or the anti-gender movement is just a populist movement, but there is a complex synergy between actors such as um, uh, Peace the, in Poland, Vox in um, Spain, or Brothers of Italy um, in um, in Italy on the one side, and uh, th these these big and smaller organizations that are invested in uh, attacks against what they call gender ideology. Um, uh, in our book, we call this connection. Um, um, opportunistic synergy. We look at what the two sides gain and how they manage to win elections together and what happens once they do, as they have in Poland and uh, and Hungary. Uh, but the connection is more complex than that. Uh, it's not just a, um, it's not just an alliance. It's also a kind of kinship uh, of um, uh, structures of thinking. And the core structure is, of course, that which makes populism populism is the juxtaposition between elite and the people. The, 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 the most important thing I realized at some point about the anti-gender movement is that it's run by people that are very well connected and very rich and who have somehow managed to present themselves as defenders of the common people. Um, uh, so this identification with the common man is, is absolutely central to what, how, and what, what makes anti-genderism work. Um, I would add, uh, in connection to the previous talk, that the common mother is a very important figure, or the woman who has been cheated out of motherhood is another one. Uh, the second point, um, which is actually how our adventure with this topic started, is that we realized that the word colonization is used repeatedly in different contexts um, and with great success by the anti-gender movement. Anti-gender movement mm, rhetoric uh, presents this movement as an anti-colonial force, as a resistance against a, a global um network of elites uh, who have uh, access to power in places like the UN, World Health Organization, and so on, and who are colonizing uh, ordinary people. And of course, they are not colonizing ordinary people all around the world in the same ways. This is a rhetorical device that has a different spin in Eastern Europe than it does in Africa. And I think, but 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 it's important to look at it as something more than a metaphor. It is a real capture of the idea that uh, colonialism is bad and must be resisted. Um, the idea is here is that gender itself is a form of colonization and therefore resistance to gender is a way to preserve 
local um, national identity. And in our book, we look at how this metaphor uh, operates. And the third point, um, and this is one that I think doesn't get us very far in conferences held in America, in the US, um, because I think the US anti-gender rhetoric is different in this regard, but certainly in Europe, we argue anti-genderism contains a strong critique of neoliberalism. It is not um, yet another version of the alliance between con uh, ultra conservatives and neoliberals. In other words, it's not neoconservatism, it is something different. Gender in um, the rhetoric of groups like Manif Pour Tous in, in, in France or um, AFD anti-gender campaigns is very often associated with evils caused by the free market. And in, a, in, a, in an ongoing project that I'm involved in now, I'm actually looking at some of those images, such as babies with barcodes or pregnant women with, with barcodes on their bellies. This is an obsessive um, uh, visual theme, which I think is quite meaningful. The idea that something has happened to Western civilization, which has made turned us into baby sellers and buyers. And this seems to be connected with a with, with a broader critique of what the left calls neoliberalism. It also is um, connected to um, a view of feminism um, as basically a form of individualistic selfishness. The idea that feminism is just uh, a plot to get rich women even richer and most women uh, to abandon motherhood is, is an old right wing idea. And it has this new um, spin in the anti-gender movement, especially I think it's it's very vivid in France um, uh, where motherhood is, is taken up a lot. So th this last insight has been pushed by scholars from Eastern Europe um, and has been resisted at first by scholars from Western Europe, which I thought was interesting. Um, in an article published in the early days of research on this topic, um, uh, Veronika Grzebalska, Esther Kovacs, and um, Andrea Peto um, uh, say that um, gender is has become a symbolic glue um, signifying the failure of democratic representation and different facets of the current socioeconomic order from the prioritization of identity politics over material issues to the weakening of people's social, cultural, and political security to the detachment of social and political elites and the influence of transnational institutions. In other words, this is a movement that manages to take up real grievances, real anxieties, and reframe them as moral failures and to then um, re-signify them as all somehow connected to this one evil they call gender ideology. This is this is actually complex cultural work um, that should, should, should be appreciated for its complexity. So given these three introductory points, I hope they will be relevant um, to what I have to say. Let's get, get back to the core question. Does geography matter? Now, I think this idea that it does is more and more accepted by scholars on the topic, but um, I remember my surprise when I read in uh, David Paternotta's um, and um, Roman Kuhar's article, an important overview of the scholarship, um, a very, um, uh, well, brief and perfunctory uh, disclaimer of the relevance of geography. And in, tw in, tw uh, in 2018, they say, despite the fact that some differences can be credited to historical and political contexts, the East-West divide does not offer a particularly useful analytical lens. And I must say, I gasped with surprise as that, because to me, it's absolutely clear that the East-West divide matters and that the war against gender actually makes it matter even more. Um, and um, I, I'm thinking that the, that the the famous Putin quotes on J.K. Rowling and so on um, have have made that more vivid, also to people living to the to to the west of Poland. But well, that's something up for discussion. How does the how does the war in Ukraine change our views on the east-west divide? So my view is that there are several reasons to see Eastern European movements and discourses as distinctive, um, and furthermore, to argue for the region's special place in both anti-gender imaginary and the movement strategy. In other words, geography should matter to how we look at this movement, but also we should appreciate that it matters to the movement. They have things to say about geography. Um, so I will. my argument will progress in four steps. 
uh, naming what makes uh, Central European, uh, Central Eastern European anti-genderism distinctive. The, the first claim is, is fairly obvious. The campaigns in this part of the world are stronger, uh, have greater political effectiveness. They have actually won elections for people like Orban and Kaczynski. And I will stop at that. I think that's pretty clear. My second point is that um, there are features of the rhetoric, uh, anti-gender rhetoric that are unique to the region. Anti when, they, when Eastern European pundits, anti-gender pundits, decry anti-gender uh, ideology, they immediately make references to Soviet propaganda. They basically say it's a new version of communism and not just cultural Marxism, uh, which is which may seem like a small shift, but, but it, it's actually a pretty big shift um, because to connect it to the Soviet past is to um, link it to, tol to tol totalitarianism, um, which 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 is a word that that actually flies around a lot, but it's um, but it's much more meaningful if you're living in a place like Poland or Slovakia. Um, also, in a recent article, I've argued that there is an anti-Semitic subtext to anti-gender discourse, um, and it actually originates in the United States, as far as I've been able to trace. Um, I've circulated my paper. Um, uh, called um, Jewish perversion as a strategy of domination. So I, I will not refer to it in great detail, but my point now is that this anti-Semitic subtext is repressed very carefully in places like Germany, um, but it's actually pretty out there in the open um, in places like Poland or, or Slovakia. The claim that um, gender is an invention of a lesbian, um, uh, of a lesbian, Jew or Jewish lesbian, and of course that refers to Judith Butler, uh, is is made in in journal articles on the far right and uh, circulated in Polish uh, uh, internet. Um, I don't think you can find that so easily in in Germany, for instance. Um, the third argument has to do with the side with the idea that uh, gender is a form of invasion the colonialism frame gets recast in Eastern Europe and particularly in Poland and Hungary um, as an invasion uh, coming from the West, but specifically from Germany. My favorite example of this, and we discuss it in some detail in our book, is a film, a documentary film called Invasion, which was aired on Polish public television on the eve of um, 2019 elections um, focusing on LGBT organizations and pride marches organized in that year all over Poland. Um, the film pretends to be a kind of a piece of investigative journalism uncovering uh, the financial and moral outrages committed by the LGBT groups. They fail to uncover anything, but the images and the music accompanying this investigation um, is, is completely militaristic. In other words, you see slow motion groups of gays and especially drag queens, uh, photos taken in films, film footage taken in um, during the Berlin Love Parade um, with superimposed marching music. And you have you get talking heads uh, speaking about um, pedo pride. Uh, in other words, the plot of um, uh, the, the gay plot of, of kidnapping children in order to molest them and so on. So so there is a there is a militaristic and patriotic version of the the usual argument that gays are really pedophiles, and then there is the next step: the argument that this invasion is in effect wants to destroy, colonize, and depopulate Poland. Um, my fourth argument has to do with uh, the, the the map of the world in which, as my title announced, Eastern Europe is pure. Eastern Europe is um, um, capable of resistance to the evils of gender, and Eastern Europe is poised to save the West from the corruption that is gender. And this argument, which is completely wild, if you think about it, uh, it keeps jumping up uh, at me um, in different anti-gender texts, sometimes in the form of elaborate analogies and metaphors. Um, but maybe before we get to the metaphors, it's, it's useful to, to just read the classic. Gabrielle Kubi, one of the founding mothers of anti-genderism in her book, The Global Sexual Revolution, um, basically says that this is a quote, now the Eastern European countries are becoming aware of this uh, trend, and my great hope is that the Eastern European countries will become a stronghold of resistance in the European Union. 
so the, the map is there. And then the question is, well, how do you make things move on that map? And they're quite creative at it. Marzena Nikiel, a very influential figure in Poland since that she's become a, since 2014. In 2014, she published this book about the uh, the trap of gender, which, which is basically a conspiracy theory. Um, and it ends with this bizarre uh, quote, which is actually borrowed from um, an American anti-gender thinker called Jones. He's the hero of my book on anti-Semitism, on my article on anti-Semitism. But the, the quote itself is what I want to turn your attention to. It is Poland's calling to save the West. Jan Sobieski, the king, came to Vienna with his cavalry and thus saved the West and saved Christianity. Now there is a new enemy at our gates. This new enemy is Wilhelm Reich and the second sexual revolution um, um, and sexual education. The world looks to Poland with the hope that Poland shall save the West once again. And what makes this particularly amusing is not just references to Jan Sobieski, every Polish child knows about his great victory against the Muslims and how he saved Europe, supposedly. Um, it's also that the same idea is um, thrown at other Eastern European countries. Um, so uh, if you read research on uh, anti-genderism on Bulgaria, well, the world is looking to Bulgaria to save Europe from genderism. If you read about Croatia, well, Croatia um, is the shield of Christendom, we read on the TFP um, uh, website. In the past, Croatia was known as the shield of Christendom, thanks to glorious defense of Europe against the Mohammedan invasions. Today, we deem it the shield of the family. So there is a kind of Eastern European exceptionalism at play, and each country is addressed as the potential savior of the West. May her example be followed in the West and throughout the world. Um, well, all this would be amusing if it weren't for happening for real, if the, if it wasn't driving um, radical nationalist uh, discourse in each of these countries, and if it wasn't being funded, at least one third of the money is now it, we know for sure is coming from Russia. So, um, and I do recommend this as a reading uh, for those of you who are actually interested in in, in the flow of funding. Um, Neil Data's uh, Tip of the Iceberg um, report published in 2021, um, published last year, actually looks at where the money is, is, how the money is flowing. And one third of it is coming from Russian oligarchs. So how is Russia relevant to all this? Um, one uh, one way to say to to see it, and this is how we started um, uh, um, making the connection, is that it's an ideological connection. The idea that the East shall save the West from itself repeats the core claims made by Alexander Dugin and other messianic nationalist interpretation of Central European um, Christianity. The claim that Russia is destined to be a savior of European civilization is a central tenet of Russian um, ideology, of Russian imperialism, and of Russian anti-genderism. Basically, anti-genderism was put to work in service of this imperial mission. But similar claims, of, as, I, as I've sh shown, are made about Poland, Bulgaria, and Croatia. Um, so the, the, the connection is that some of the inspirations are coming from Russia, uh, but you can also see it from the other side. For instance, American uh, masculinist movements tend to idealize Russia as the place where men are still men. For instance, the M um, MG Taos, the men going their own way, uh, have written uh, very um, nostalgic essays about Russia as the place to go. So, so this is this, the special place of Russia on the gender map of the world is actually coming from different places. But then there is Russian uh, propaganda um, and Russian uh, and Putin's um, um, justifications of the war in Ukraine, which use gender repeatedly. I'm not saying it's the is the main or the most important justification. The main one is, of course, about NATO supposedly being too pushy and too um, and not careful enough. Uh, but the one about gender keeps propping up and it seems to be significant, especially 
internally. In other words, it's a way not so much to conv convince West, the, the Western publics that the war is correct. That's where the NATO argument comes in. It's a way to, con to convince Russians that the war is necessary. Russian media have been presenting since about 20, uh, 2012 um, uh, the West as an upside down world heading for self annihilation with children being given away to gays and pedophiles, marriages being destroyed willfully to protect women from so-called violence. Of course, violence against women is a fake, is, is leftist fake news and manipulation in this uh, discourse. Teenagers and even children are subjected to compulsory sex change. Um, in October last year, Putin um, said it is monstrous that children in the West are taught uh, the idea that a boy can become a girl. Um, how does this link up to the invasion? Well, um, Patriarch Kirill um, made a speech uh, early during the invasion, I think it was in March, defending um, uh, defending the right of Donbass to be free uh, from gay parades. Um, it's an extensive quote, very interesting, that I encourage you to look up, where he talks about um, the power of the West um, being exerted through gay parades and the, the resistance of Donbass in need of aid from Russia. So basically, Russia's invasion is a form of saving Donbass from gay parades. And then a few weeks later, Putin uh, compared um, Russia to J.K. Rowling. Um, it, it was a very strange analogy, which Rowling actually um, commented upon. She said she would have nothing to do with it. Um, after uh, This was after Rowling's transphobic statements and uh, her mistreatment or, well, rejection by leftist media. The, the analogy was that Rowling has been canceled because the West has a way of canceling people and countries, and Russia is was presented as a victim of such a cancellation. So basically, Russia's war is presented as a necessary reaction to these humiliating acts of Western imperialism, and the essence of this imperialism is gender ideology. So to conclude, um, The story of anti-genderism in Eastern Europe is not just one about the power of, Catholic, of the Catholic Church in certain countries, although admittedly anti-genderism is strongest where the Catholic Church is strongest, so Poland, Croatia, Slovenia. Um, but it is also a story about intense collaboration between the most conservative forces within the Catholic Church and nationalist groups in the respective countries and populist political parties. Right-wing populist resistance to gender is presented in Eastern Europe as Eastern Europe's proud determination to withstand Western domination and the requirement uh, that Eastern Europe emulate or imitate the West. The movements in question effectively combine a socially conservative agenda with a critique of some aspects of neoliberalism, tapping into existing anxieties and disillusionments. Ultimately, they feed polarization and strengthen authoritarian tendencies. This is why anti-gender activity in various countries is being assiduously aided and to some extent funded by Putin's Russia. But the link with Russia is not just strategic, it is also ideological with the recurring claim that the East will save the West from itself, from moral corruption, from decadence, from Jews, possibly. Anti-genderism repeats the core claims of Russian messianic ultra-conservatism. The anti-gender argument serves as a code for expression of anti-EU sentiments and a broader resentment of the liberal West, often with an anti-Semitic subtext. Resistance to gender has become a new language for nationalism in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we check again if, um, if they can hear me on, on Zoom? Yes, excellent. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Shamira Parmanon from the London School of Economics. She holds a master's degree in development studies from the University of Melbourne and a doctorate in multidisciplinary gender studies from the University of Cambridge. 
She previously served as a Gender and Human Rights Teaching Fellow at the London School of Economics Department of Gender Studies and is a lecturer at the University of Vermont Department of Theater. Her doctoral research examines sex trafficking discourses and intervention in the Philippines from a critical perspective. Her research interrogates how state interventions directed toward women in the global south reflect and shape women's lived realities with a focus on gender and international development, the politics of knowledge production and feminist entanglements with the state on issues of human rights and women's precarious labor. Please, oh, sorry. Her paper today um, is entitled Tensions and Intersections, Examining the Political Dynamics of Resistance to Gender and Sexual Rights in the Philippines. Please join me in, in welcoming Professor Fernand. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I just want to check that you can hear me. All right. Yes, we can hear um, you. Thank you. Um, so first, I would just like to thank um, the organizers for putting this together. And it's a uh, and I'm quite sad to not be able to join you in person, but really glad that they made this hybrid conference possible. Um, so just a few more things from my end. I'm actually still with LSE, so I'm calling in from the UK. Uh, and we've had issues with our internet infrastructure recently, so I hope this holds at least for as long as I'm speaking. Um, all right, so today I'll be talking about a working paper as well, so it's, it's a work in progress, about the political dynamics of the resistance to gender and sexual rights in the Philippines. And listening to the previous speakers, I've already identified some points of difference in how this is playing out in the context of the Philippines. So very briefly, I'll give you an overview of the social political context. I'll talk about post-colonial contradictions, um, the co-optation of human rights language by anti-gender actors, um, and how it plays out in the context of um, benevolent paternalism rather than complete antagonism and um, some reflection on where we might go from here in the context of the Philippines. So brief, briefly, what is the environment like? What is the operating environment like in terms of gender and sexual rights? There is a mixture of acceptance and, and rejection. So there is a high visibility in traditional and social media of LGBT individuals and increasingly in politics as well. Um, and LGBT groups are highly organized politically. There is an ongoing proposed SOGI law, um, which has received significant publicity, but it has been blocked by Christian lawmakers. And to this day, uh, it remains pending. It is the longest pending proposed legislation in our um, Senate. Uh, there are still rampant violent crimes against trans individuals. And there is the high profile case of a Filipino trans woman who was murdered by an American soldier in US bases. And he was found guilty, but then suddenly pardoned by President Duterte, um, former President Duterte. Uh, over 80% of Filipinos identify as Christian, most of whom are Catholics. And there is a rising influence of um, evangelism. And the central authorities remain quite conservative um, and toe the institutional line with respect to LGBT. LGBT issues and um, the general framing is uh, ranges from you know hostility to love the sin or hate the sin paternalism, but within the constituency itself, within the broader population, there is a wider range of views. There's also an extensive network of Catholic universities who essentially reproduce the country's political elite. Um, one interesting thing about the Philippines is we don't have much party discipline. Um, so people change parties all the time, and we don't have, you know, long-standing political parties that are preserved across election cycles. Um, and a lot of it is a lot of the politics is very personality dependent and dependent on family dynasties. So there isn't really a progressive party um, and a conservative party. And so on the one hand, uh, this presents an opportunity because LGBT rights are not a partisan issue, and you see support from a, from different sides of the political spectrum. But on the other hand, it's dependent upon the whims of individual politicians, and it's hard to, to find institutional citing or an institutional base for it. Um, in terms of the post-colonial context, so this one is quite similar to um, the previous speaker's observations. Um, gender and sexual rights are framed by opponents as an attack on Filipino values and a form of Western imperialism. And these kinds of arguments do have 
resonance in the context of the Philippines being a former colony. And even actually for some women's rights groups, trans rights in particular are seen as not important as fighting against poverty. Um, it's seen as bourgeois, as American, as frivolous. Um, and partly because Filipino feminist movements emerged from the Philippine left. Um, so in terms of their legacies and their history, they rejected the sexism and misogyny in the left, but then doubled down on mobilizing around the identity category woman. There's a political investment in seeing it as you know, a victimhood or in the gender binary. So there's a tendency to gatekeep it even among these movements. Um, now, this is ironic, obviously, because the Catholic influence on Philippine politics is a legacy of Spanish colonization. The gender binary is a colonial imposition in various ways by both American and Spanish colonizers. And I'll speak to that again at the end. There is um, strong evidence of expansive, fluid conceptions of gender and sexuality in pre-colonial Philippines. Um, and the other irony is that anti-gender and anti-abortion campaigns in the Philippines are funded by US-based Christian conservative organizations, such as Human Life International, which has poured in you know, millions to fund um, front groups in the Philippines. And uh, you know, these, these groups have lobbied the church to threaten, uh, to excommunicate uh, politicians who might back reproductive rights or gender and sexual rights. And there is some political traction there uh, we're not, we don't, I mean, the Catholic Church is not as much of a voting bloc or a political influence as it was in the past, but it is still quite significant. Okay. The next noteworthy thing, which might reflect some of the patterns that were also mentioned in, the, in, in Roy's introduction, actually, is the, is the co-optation of human rights language by anti-gender actors. So increasingly, there is a use of constitutional challenges as a political strategy to block or dilute um, progressive legislation. So they kept challenging the reproductive health and reproductive rights law. Um, but eventually when the law was passed, they kept challenging specific provisions of the law. Uh, and in some of these challenges, the courts ruled in their favor. Um, and these challenges are well-funded by Western conservative organizations and they receive you know, legal advice and technical support from these organizations. So our legal system is heavily patterned after the US system. Um, and so we've, we've seen that happening. There are strong appeals to religious and academic freedom. So a discussion of how uh, gen gender and sexual rights would actually violate uh, the rights of religious people to not discriminate, <laughs> uh, sorry, to discriminate or to not um, accept alternative formulations of gender beyond the binary. And so here they are speaking specifically about religious employers or religious teachers um, and educators, uh, religious businessmen, and also appeals to academic freedom. So as I've mentioned, we have a wide network of um, Catholic and Christian universities, and they are not identical in terms of their uh, conservatism. So some of them are more conservative than others. Uh, it also depends on which um, order. Um, and they have also been at the for forefront of saying that the ability to teach a specific theological interpretation is a form of academic freedom. And you know, asking them to have gender neutral toilets on campus or even to accept an LGBT organization uh, or to teach certain texts or to hire certain faculty would be a violation of their academic freedom. Um, and increasingly, the figure of the child has been uh, weaponized already in um, public discourse and public debates. So conversations around um, protecting young children from um, contagious trans identities or LGBT identities. Um, so at no, I mean, our, our discussion around um, trans identities is, is in no way similar to what's happening in the UK or the US at this moment. That's not necessarily a good thing. A lot of it is just because there is a lack of awareness around it or even a lack of recognition, but it's starting to happen. And there are calls for this to be incorporated within the, sec, uh, the youth sex education programs, which are mandated by the reproductive rights law actually, um, but hasn't been officially rolled out because of all these constitutional challenges. So one facet of these challenges is um, the refute the, that they are trying to defend the right of parents to opt out of this and also to ensure that the content of these programs like do not veer away from the gender binary. So don't teach LGBT propaganda. Um, 
the, so the Senate president of the Philippines, Tito Soto, is, is, is fairly conservative and basically has um, declared that the SOGI bill is not going to pass and has characterized it as a, as a, a form of class legislation that only aims to protect a certain sector of society. So it's kind of like flipping um, the burden, saying that why do you need special rights when in general, discrimination is already illegal in the constitution and the bill of rights already guarantees everyone equality before the law. So you are essentially asking for special rights. So that's how it's being framed. But at the same time, this same, the same man, the same official is also saying that anti-discrimination laws are dangerous because they may open up the path for same-sex marriages. Um, so in the same breath, these arguments are being made. Um, another thing to point out about the flavor of anti-genderism or threats to gender and sexual rights in the Philippines is there is a contrast with other anti-gender politicians. So like, or trends like Bolsonaro or Trump or Orban um, in that it isn't um, necessarily framed explicitly as anti-feminist or anti-LGBT. Um, so the, it, it, it's, a, it's, a form, it's a more subtle um, opposition to it. So for example, Duterte, Rodrigo Duterte, our former president, um, and his daughter, who is now the vice president because we have political dynasties, um, leveraged the protection of women and LGBT politics in their presidential and vice presidential campaign. So Duterte repeatedly spoke about his track record of protect, protecting LGBT individuals against violence when he was mayor of Davao City. And his daughter actually, you know, revealed that she was LGBT. I mean, this raised some suspicion because that was the first time people heard of it during the campaign. Um, the Marcos family has styled themselves as LGBT allies and Bongbong Marcos, current president, his sister, who's a senator, again, political dynasties, is actually one of the sponsors of the Soji anti-discrimination bill. And these dynasties are supported by LGBT bloggers and political com uh, commentators. But despite these concrete promises that Duterte and his daughter and Ma Marcos made uh, to deliver an anti-discrimination legislation, there has been no material improvement in gender and sexual rights under their leadership. And as I mentioned, Duterte actually pardoned the US soldier who murdered a trans woman. Uh, Duterte's violent war on drugs was also underpinned by benevolent paternalism. So his giant, uh, his big speeches about protecting women and children against bad men, but obviously increased police powers as we've observed elsewhere, you know, under the war on drugs or the COVID lockdown has had a first adverse effects on LGBT individuals. So they were targeted quite systematically by the police uh, and they were marked because um, I guess these bodies are seen as non-normative, not worthy of occupying public space. So there were instances of LGBT individuals forced to like engage in, in sexual acts as punishment for reaching lockdown. Um, but Duterte also styles, styled himself as pro-women in the context of protecting mothers, protecting women from domestic violence, or so threatening to beat up their husbands um, and other good women. So as long as these women did not transgress their culturally prescribed roles and they were stereotypically feminine and stereotypically like agreeable. So it's, it's a very mixed, you have both, um, some people would refer to it as queer baiting. I, I would like to think that there might be a bit more potential here, but you have both mobilizing LGBT and women's rights branding, and at the same time, kind of undermining it happening in the same frame, which is quite a challenge for activists because we need to learn better how to navigate that space. Is the solution to really disengage completely or is the solution to, I mean, to try to find entry points and openings, but also at the service of, potentially legitimizing some of these authoritarian projects. So I don't have an answer to that yet. And that's one thing I'm trying to think around, think through um, in the paper. But in terms of where we might go from here and the bits that I am a bit more certain about, one, I think in the context of the Philippines, it's important to recognize multiple systems of gender and sexual categorizations that do not neatly map into Western LGBT classifications. So for example, the Filipino figure of the bakla uh, is a more expansive conception. Uh, so the whole like man born in a, sorry, woman born in a man's body, which is something that, you know, Western LGBT movements might disavow is actually a reality for you know, non-normative sexual and gender identities in the Philippines. So distinction between sex and gender isn't also as clear. So 
to reflect this multiplicity in campaigning for rights rather than just copy pasting. Um, but at the same time, Western campaigns have had a big influence in how uh, LGBT individuals, especially the more urban, uh, cosmopolitan, middle class individuals, have started defining themselves. And you know, it has given them a vocabulary for articulating rights and demands. So it's about making sure that the movement doesn't become exclusionary um, and paying close attention to class issues. Second, just are insisting that broader issues such as aggressive policing or poverty have direct effects on the lives of LGBT individuals, especially in a lower middle income country, and they need to be incorporated. And finally, to consider critical collaboration with more progressive religious constituencies, because in the context of the Philippines, there is, it is impossible to successfully campaign for something without some backing from faith-based sectors. Obviously, understanding the pitfalls and the limitations of that and the danger of being wrapped up in politics that we might not agree with the implications of, but um, also navigating that therein very, very carefully. Okay, I think my um, 15 minutes are up. So thank you very much, everyone. And I look forward to chatting more later. Thank you very much. Actually, it was even under uh, 15 minutes. Um, thank you again uh, to all the presenters. Um, our discussant for today, for this panel, is Deborah Nelson from the University of Chicago. She is the Helen B. and Frank L. Salzberger Professor of English and Chair of the Department of English. Her book, Tough Enough, Arbus Arendt, Didion McCarthy, Zontag, and Vey won the Modern Language as Languages Association James Russell Lowell Prize for Best Book for 2017 and the Gordon Ling Prize in 2019 for the most distinguished contribution to the University of Chicago Press by a faculty member. She's also the author of Pursuing Privacy in the Cold War America, and articles published in the PMLA, American Literary History, Contemporary Literature, Feminist Studies, and in several edited collections. Nelson led a Mellon-funded Sawyer seminar titled At 1948, and edited with Leela Gandhi a special issue of critical inquiry devoted to the topic. She's also the founding member of the research collective Post 45. She has been the Deputy Provost for Graduate Education from 2011 to 2015, and the Director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality from 2006 to 2009. She has continued her work on graduate education with grants from the NEH in 2016 and the Mellon Foundation in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nelson. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I uh, can guarantee you I would have been with you breathing my um, respiratory infection all over you in 2019, but uh, I think if, if there's one lesson I've learned from COVID is not to do that. So I am very pleased to be invited to be part of this. These are the most urgent questions I think we're facing right now. Uh, in a host of urgent questions. Um, so I want I have a few sections. These are really questions for everybody, but sort of track some of the themes and um, <clears throat> issues across um, the different talks today or the versions that I read, <laughs> which are very close to, to these. So, um, so history itself is sort of, this is the title of the panel and it's a part of these, um, talks in different ways. Uh, sorry, let me just turn off my outlook. Um, and it's, it's sort of deeply paradoxical and, and, and contested in each of the talks. Um, each um, of the anti-gender movements in their different locations um, deploy a sense of history, a tradition or a norm as a fact, and it doesn't really exist um, in, Parmenon's talk, the gender configurations defended as traditional were in fact products of colonialization, which supplanted a more uh, fluid terrain of gender and sexuality. And Bracewell's, the normative family of the conservative movement in the US defies the actual history of the family in the US. 
Um, and in Graf's paper, the East, in the Eastern European context, anti-gender ideologies seek to restore a pre-Soviet past by returning to a national form of Christian family life that in turn fends off the neo-colonial gender arrangements being imposed by the decadent West. So there's a kind of um, unlocated national history tradition of this family. So it strikes me that we're not really talking about history in any of these cases. Um, we're talking about myths of the past. Um, and since we are academics and committed to a factually accurate, reasonable and logically coherent account of the past, um, the position we're sometimes in is that we have to say, no, here's the real story. This is the actual past. Um, and we're trying to counter myth with fact. Um, is that a strategy? Is, are there, is that, is that a useful thing to do? Um, or how, in what ways can that be a useful thing to do? Um, what are the viable ways of restoring or reanimating and making compelling a past that runs counter to the anti-gender myths of the past? Um, and so this leads to the question that um, uh, Bracewell formulates um, the most clearly, just that's her tack that she took here, is what, I mean, what is the usable past? Um, so if the mother category that Bracewell is trying to um, rescue from its current deployments, um, that there is a feminist past that was built around the figure of the mother. Um, I remember Chris Stanzel's book where she talks about the early, you know, uh, 19th century and first wave feminist movements organized around the mother and second wave feminists organizing around the daughter. Um, and that the, the mother can be, as she shows, uh, a, a kind of figure of radical change. Um, so I guess one of the things is what are the categories um, that the left could rally around that they could be avatars of change, but also feel familiar, all encompassing, familiar and powerful. Um, is the mother one of those? Obviously two of you think so. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about is the movements that um, Bracewell mentioned, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the Mothers Against Gun Violence, do not offer a robust figure of the mother in their literature or in their kind of uh, self-descriptions. Um, they're really focused around the loss of a child um, and the mother is the figure for grief and loss. Um, so I, I just wondered if there is something um, available in that blankness um, that the mother figure, they, they don't try to fill it in. And presumably that leaves the figure open to being filled in um, in different ways that it's not, um, it doesn't, you don't have to be a certain kind of mother. Um, and in fact, the, the movement is built around this, the solidarity between mothers grieving. Um, but, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving had a, a, a man as one of its presidents um, somewhere in the middle of its 40-year um, history. Um, so I just wondered, uh, what are the ways that you're thinking about animating that figure um, and what have been successful? What are some things that could be modeled? Um, the other thing that struck me is that human rights is a particularly vexed issue um, as a banner, um, as Parmenon has argued the human rights framework has been co-opted by the anti-gender movement. It's available to a rights model. And this is especially noteworthy to me because um, arguably the most well-funded and prestigious international feminist organizations are almost all organized around a human rights framework. Um, so are they doing anything in light of this co-optation? Um, and the more general question, is the rights framework the framework to work with? Is it, is it, um, is it something that can, um, you know, even let's say in an emergency, provide some kind of protection uh, for groups in, in, in areas where a rights framework is, is legible and sensible and kind of intuitive? Um, um, the, the third sort of banner is religion, as, as all of you have mentioned in some way or another. Um, and as Graf explained with such clarity, um, it's a certain version of Christianity that's being wielded. And the church is the accomplice and handmaiden of the nationalist future and the violence that's embedded in it. Um, this is a truly worldwide 
um, movement as Parmenon's paper also deals with that the US evangelical churches, but other um, evangelical churches and other churches um, are, are built around uh, funding an international anti-gender movement. Um, and in particular, and you see this, I, I don't, um, I don't think this is universal, but it's quite salient, um, is that the, that these, um, the salvific violence that's embedded in these movements is a genuine threat. Um, it, it is a, a it is a, a fantasy that's barely concealed, this kind of reverse crusade in, in Graf's paper, but we see it here in the US too. And, you know, as Parmenon said at the last bit of her talk, you know, can we abandon religion as a workable framework for gender freedom? Can we simply offer secular freedom in the place of religious mission, and particularly a mi mission um, that has uh, a kind of apocalyptic narrative associated with it that is, uh, that feels incredibly urgent and compelling. Um, so that's one set of questions. Uh, another set of questions is the question of the timeline so that we're, um, we find ourselves, let's say, uh, cast in a kind of um, historical timeline that we did not choose. So to return to a different gender configuration from the past to, you know, is it positions us inevitably as being the avatars, avant-garde of some kind of future. Um, and in some ways you're all saying that's not even actually true. We, we could also be, we could also be positioning ourselves as, as um, a restoration of some kind of past. Um, but that's not how, how it looks and how it tends to get cast is that the, the, the gender and sexual avant-garde is leading us into this unfamiliar and, and in some cases horrific future. Um, do we want to be the future? Is that how we want to be in this dialogue? Can we separate out from the timeline that's being laid out in the anti-gender movement with a different kind of telos or different kind of uh, framework altogether? Um, how do we break out of that past future framing? Um, what do you put in its place? Um, because I feel like that's something we don't have to um, actually, we don't have to actually adopt that framework. Um, and so that's one question. And then my final question, and I don't know how we're gonna go about talking about all these things. And there's, I'm sure the audience has many and probably better questions. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, is that the question of national uh, nationalism and internationalism um, that you know that we're in this? Um, it, it's very easy to fall into kind of a conspiratorial framework with the the evangelical church, you know, taking the place of the elders of Zion or something. But um, that these are international; these are very well funded international groups who are funding nationalist movements in different places with different agendas. So there's not a unifying agenda um, other than anti-gender um, for these different national movements. I mean, ultimately one would have to think there's like a, a kind of conflict ahead with each one securing its national boundaries and any deviance from a, the anti-gender ideology being a kind of war uh, cry. Um, but, Again, we come up with the truth teller framework, um, the unmasking framework, like, no, don't you see all of these movements are being funded internationally. Um, is that a strategy? Um, and I'm not saying it's not a strategy. It could be a strategy um, to point out the extent of uh, the international um, presence um, within these supposedly homegrown local and nationalist movements. Um, and what forms of international solidarity might be worthwhile. Um, it seems uh, that it might not be the best strategy to counter an a well-funded international strategy of anti-gender terrorism against uh, or terrorization of gender and sexual nonconformists with small local 
um, movements. It doesn't mean you you have to, you actually do, of course, have to have those things, but is there some kind of international solidarity that would be beneficial, um, not just money, but the sharing of ideas, strategies, and other kinds of things. But of course, we're in a position where we don't have any billionaires on our side, so it's a sort of a, um, doesn't put us in the in, in the best position with the uh, funding of international movements. But there is there there are ways of doing that. Um, so those are sort of the things that that struck me as urgent about the talks and as having a kind of um, connective tissue across the papers. Um, and so I I leave it to the experts to uh, help guide us through these questions. Thank you. Um, maybe we can go uh, allow the um, presenters to respond in in the order in which they presented. Sure. I think. This, this means me first. Yes, I mean you, Lauren, and go. <laughs> okay, just making sure. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I think that this, um, this idea of contesting the, the way in which we are positioned in the narrative as representing the future um, with the past is fascinating. And, um, you know, I, I my impulse is to think that's like a potentially productive, I mean, it's, it's not unlike what what Anne and I are arguing with respect to motherhood, like can can queer anti-capitalist, anti-racist radicals plausibly cast themselves rhetorically, credibly cast themselves rhetorically as mothers? I mean, can can we plausibly rhetorically cast ourselves as like traditionalists or something like this too? I mean, um, it, it it and you know I, I'm reflecting on Woodhull. I mean, she does this. It's not unlike what Eugene Debs. Did right um, so effectively at the turn of the century, right? Situating um, his anti-capitalism in you know Jeffersonianism um, as opposed to to Marxism or something like you know, um, and and Woodhull is, does this. I often I often call it her bizarro Reaganism. Um, she thinks that America is a kind of world historic um, nation that is you know, a kind of city on a hill, but for all these, you know, kind of monstrous <laughs> um, ideas, uh, you know, so so that was the kind of gambit that, that Woodhull made herself. And um, so thank you for inviting, you know, me to kind of think about that. Um, as for the comment about, is there something productive about the kind of blankness of the figure of the mother, um, the, the under, specifiedness of um I, I i tend to think so so this was an experience that i had going to these school board meetings and interacting with these these groups i often you know they would be like i'm a mom for blah um i'm a mom i'm here as a mom speaking to protect my children in their in their opening and i would have no clue what side of the issue they were about to <laughs> argue on behalf of you you can't tell by looking. <laughs> you you can't even tell by the first two or three minutes of their public comment, right? Um, that to me is not a not a strength. That's that's a weakness. Um, you know, um, because there was a tendency, I think, given the like deep history, the 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 potency, and, and just the, the we're we're all habituated to hearing right-wing activists speak as mothers in defense of children. So there's a kind of default, right? Um, anybody who starts to speak in that way is kind of taken to be speaking from this place, taking this position. And it kind of bolsters or, or reifies this way, this, this this conservative ultimately figuration of the mother. So I think that underspecifiedness is actually like a liability. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but thank you so much for those wonderful comments and thank you to all the other panelists and all the links that were dropped. This is incredibly helpful. <laughs> I guess it's my turn. Um, I'm 
thank you for your comments. I'm glad they were recorded so I can listen again and take notes. So I'll just pick and choose the themes that struck me as, as answerable. Um, I guess the, the 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 easiest question to answer is the one about motherhood. Um, I think that not only is there a feminist and leftist potential in the figure of mother, but I think that it is the last resort and the, the one place where the left should go. And I'm very worried that it is not going there. Um, uh, I was um, my, my book Mother and Feminist was uh, started a hurricane of debate on in Polish feminism, which then kind of subsided and we went back to business as usual, which is basically um, individualism. And my argument is that if the left uh, once, well, and I've, I'm not the only person making this argument, obviously, that if feminism is to be a movement for the 99%, it has to focus on reproductive labor. And the the you know the layperson's word for that is motherhood. So, and I don't think there's anything wrong with the word motherhood. We don't really have to, um, you know, parenthood is maybe better, but you know, motherhood is great and it has a long tradition. And what does that word mean from a if if reclaimed successfully by the left, which is not happening, and but I hope it will. It means uh, care work taken seriously um, by the economic system as work. Um, it means common good as something we reclaim for the sake of our children, um, but also you know, for the sake of a well-functioning society, we claim it back from neoliberalism. It basically means um, dep a departure from individual rights as the default. Um, I think that there is a there is a kind of rhetorical and imaginative potential in motherhood that can mean um I don't know how how far that word will get me in this conference, but a, a socialist ethos. Um I think the 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 right has gotten as far as it has because since the beginning of the culture wars, um, you know, I'm thinking Anita Bryant, I'm thinking um, in the American context, obviously Phyllis Schlafly, they have played the motherhood card so well. You know, this idea that your children will be, you know, captured by pedophiles or forced to go to the other sex uh, bathrooms and so on. The, the, the right wing capture of motherhood has been possible because I think the left has abandoned it and feminism specifically has not been very good at uh, dealing with it. I think, you know, since Ad Adrian Rich's um, Of Woman Born, there hasn't been a really um, fundamental book on motherhood. And I, I find that really devastating in a way. So I think we need to do it. We need to do it fast. And it's doable. As for the timeline question, I guess I'm much less optimistic than you are, because you, you move from that question to question about strategies. And where I am, you know, with Putin, you know, I mean, we're the last I heard, uh, Warsaw's mayor was looking for bunkers around Warsaw and, and counting them in case we get bombed. So, you know, um, I'm not sure we're, you know, we're at the stage where we're thinking, you know, so let's strategize against the anti-gender movement. Like, we're beyond that. Um, I think that, you know, the, the way I think of the, the, the timeline is that Western feminism, I know this is a, a broad and unjust term, but... I will use it nonetheless. That you know, the feminism that that is associated with liberal uh, democracies, governments, with the UN, and so on, um, but also academic feminism in the US has taken for granted some version of the Fukuyama thesis of the end of history. In other words, you know, since the 90s, we've been making these elaborate critiques of um, neoliberalism and um, uh, and um, liberalism, but. Taking it, taking it for granted that liberal democracy is here to stay. And it isn't. I mean, it's very clear that the anti-gender movement is part of a new wave of what we hesitate to call fascism. And, you know, different places you go, some people are willing to use the word. Some people say, just don't use that word because all hell will break, break loose. There's a, there's a wonderful essay by David Ost um, uh, about the need to, to to use that word again. And I, I frankly, I agree with him. But I, you know, I'm not I'm not obsessed with it. The, the point is that the anti gender movement is not, to my mind, as you said, the only agenda bringing these movements together. I think the anti gender 
language actually signifies something, a much broader political project, which is, you know, I, I would call it fascism, but you can call it, if you prefer, neo-traditionalism uh, combined with authoritarianism. You can call it illiberalism. Um, I'm collaborating on a project on illiberalism and how gender feeds into that. And I think that word is, you know, is, is doing some work. Um, but my point is gender is a tool and the aim is to unravel um, or to complete the project of unraveling um, liberal democracy as the go-to or the default system that we all assume, you know, the, the is, is where good countries are heading. They're not. Good countries are heading in the opposite direction and, and bad countries are, are bombing. Uh, their neighbors. Um, so my, my timeline is actually pretty catastrophic at, the, at this point, um, and I'm not very good at offering strategies, but I wouldn't be as as quick as you suggest we should be about um, abandoning the human rights discourse. I find that, I, I thought I heard you suggesting that maybe we should try another frame because that one has been uh, co-opted. I've been reading a lot of different versions of um, uh, anti-gender discourses. They will co-opt whatever is coming their way. Sure. No, they, no, I was I not mean, suggesting that we abandon. I'm just saying it, rights is in the international sphere is the only framework that's being that's, offered. That's what right. I think. That, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, I mean, uh, we know what its weak points are. We know how it's connected to colonial history. We know about, you know, uh, relativism and an anti-relativism and anti-anti-relativism, but with all these caveats, um, I think it's it's the only place that people who are being pursued by fascists, you know, have to go. And you know, and if there is this legal strategy um, used by the by by, by the, the extreme right, there is also the legal strategy used by um, uh, progressive activists in all these countries. Uh, and it leads through human rights groups like the Helsinki Foundation in Poland, for instance. So, so there is strategic litigation on both sides. And actually, I think we are still better at using the human rights framework. And there's still international courts which are more likely to buy our version of... of um, but I, I get what you're you know what you're saying they've been very good at it this idea that you know homophobia is non-existent christianophobia on the other hand right the the idea of the human rights of the fetus you know when these things started propping up a decade ago they seemed bizarre and now you know they're we speak that language i mean we are using their language in this conference by using the very idea of anti-gender Right. I mean, what the hell is anti-gender if you use the right? So so they've colonized, um, you know, the, all these discourses very successfully. Um, yeah, I guess that's 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 my response. And thank you very much for your for your comments. Oh, I'm sorry. What, one more, uh, which is kind of a personal uh, confession. You, you said that it's easy to fall into a conspiracy um, mode. Um, I experienced that uh, two years ago when I was researching my paper on the anti-Semitic subtext. I, I, I almost went crazy. And then I started reading about conspiracy theories and how they cite each other and how they, you know, inf how they infect those who try to study them. I think we are and in fact, scholars have been talking who are dealing with the conspiracy theories all go through that. So it's a it's a thing. Thank you. I guess I'll just jump in now. Thank you so much for the comments. And I echo that I'm glad this is recorded. Um, I'll speak to three points. The first one is actually to a question on the chat, which is asking about the relationship between homo nationalism and the ambiv ambivalent situation in the Philippines. The first is a caveat. I'm very, very wary of transposing, you know, these claims across contexts. What I will say is there might be traces of that in the context of the Duterte administration was very, very good at mobilizing LGBT individuals. So bloggers, community leaders to support it, but not only that. So where nationalism comes in is Duterte's drug war was highly criticized internationally by the UN, by the United States, because it was a murderous rights violating drug war. And these campaigners were on his side, arguing that the Philippines is being bullied by the West and the West doesn't understand our specific needs. 
And so there is an element of that. But again, I want to hold off on concluding that it's it's exactly the same pattern. You see, the Philippines isn't a isn't a colonial power, but internally these are systems of oppression that do exist. The second is to speak to HR. I actually have a less unfortunately less optimistic take about human rights as a field. I think of it as a field of power. I think of it as a contested site. But I think of it as something that we unfortunately need to keep engaging in. And, I, and I, I, I think that is the spirit in which this comment was made. I mean, I have thought through alternative models, not necessarily disengaging from the rights frame, because that's a battle we can't afford to um, in, ignore. But like neighboring Southeast Asian countries, for example, um, human rights don't have the same political and cultural resonance as they do in the Philippines. So for example, in Singapore, the model of activism usually involves making appeals to a benevolent state that out of a sense of charity or mercy would grant rights. And even in the context of the Philippines, there is also that tradition, largely because of our like, you know, the power of religion and the bully pulpit and all of that, right? So kind of appealing to the mercy of, of certain actors and like exaggerating one's suffering um, on a case by case basis, rather than put the arguing for legal or structural reform. So something is a need rather than a right. And those things are happening in parallel. So I don't think we need to give that up either because that's quite effective. But at the same time, I think we still need to keep engaging on, on the rights therein. And finally, on the issue of motherhood, so I'm less, um, you know, less invested in that in terms of the context of Philippines at the moment, but more the family question. Because one biggest accusation leveled against uh, you know, gender and sexual rights is that it's a threat to the family. And the family is such a central institution in, in the Philippine imaginary. And even like lots of Pope Francis' statements about threats to the family are circulated widely uh, in opposition to gender rights ideology. So what I think is important here is for um, you know, gender rights activists to continue to insist that gender and sexual rights are not incompatible with a family and instead to move to redefine what a family looks like in a context where gender and sexual rights are, are thriving or respected. What we do have working for us is our activist movements and activist orientations are not incredibly individualist, right? So it's not about individual freedom all the time and the family by gender and sexual rights campaigners isn't really defined as oppositional to individual interests anyway, or to individual freedom. A lot of times you see people thinking about how we can incorporate our family obligations and our family relationships alongside asserting gender and sexual rights. So it's a bit more collective in that sense. Um, and I think this might be a cultural nuance. I obviously don't want to like essentialize, but, but that's how it's playing out. So I think that is, and we shouldn't abandon that. We shouldn't frame this as like a liberal struggle for individual rights because we are going to lose. <laughs> Uh, so, oh, sorry. Um, how, how are we going to do the questions? Is that from um, the chair? With Because we have some online questions, but we also have uh, an audience, which I obviously can't see. maybe we'll alternate if the yeah why don't we have a question from the audience and then we'll do a question uh, from the um audience and and uh, the live audience uh in-person audience rather i should say and uh, and then from <laughs> yeah then we'll go back and forth yeah we can we can take some of the online questions then um we have uh, a question here from janet johnson who i will uh, mention uh participated in one of our earlier panels um uh in may uh focusing on um pedag pedagogical strategies um and and teaching through um this this moment and movement um janet johnson's question is directed to uh, uh agnieszka graf uh, she writes uh, putin's language since last fall has been not just anti-gender, but pointedly anti-trans, which is new, including yesterday at Valdai, though he also mentioned gay prides. I'm curious as to your thoughts about <coughs> why trans issues have become uh, have come to the fore for Putin. Uh, is this true in uh, East Central Europe as well? 
Mm -hmm. It's certainly true in Poland. Um, Kaczynski has been touring Poland, small cities, and he's cracking the same joke in every small town talking about how, uh, you know, he would like to be a woman, but he's too ugly, but he's sure that, you know, trans activists would think of him as a woman, that that sort of thing. So it's it's a way of ridiculing um, uh the enemy as as absurd. Why is Putin doing that? I think there is a kind of um, trajectory of these homophobia to anti-feminism to um, transphobia in all these right-wing movements. In other words, once uh, you find yourself in an environment where uh, gay rights are generally accepted, you turn to transphobia. And I think when Putin is addressing a Russian audience, he will still use good old, uh, you know, politicized homophobia when he's trying to... Um, perhaps speak to some part of western audiences he might that's my guess that the that the transphobic argument the cancellation of uh, of jk rowling that there that there's a weird connection or maybe resonance between some of these arguments and the the turf wars in western europe um i i was following some um uh transphobic or anti-trans feminist for uh, uh, at the time when when Putin made these comments and they were initially enthusiastic and then they realized you know who said this and that they don't necessarily want to be associated with him you know but the, but but you know basically it's I'm a transphobe and you're too and aren't we all worried about these poor little children being forced into sex change and you know and the whole idea of contagion and so on right you you know these arguments coming from strange nooks and crannies of the feminist movement especially in in, in britain but uh, you know and they, they have a much greater resonance in countries like poland and as you're saying in, in the philippines and for putin it's just another thing to put on the table but i think that that the trans woman and it is the trans woman not the trans person um, is really the ultimate horizon of hatred in this new wave of fascism. And what interests me actually is how um, that became the case, uh, because five or six years ago, I think it was more like the drag queen at the drag uh, at the at the love parade in Berlin. I mean, if you want to have the specter of the evil person, it used to be the gay men dressed up as women in women's clothes and now it's the trans woman forcing sex change so it's the 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 demon evolves and i think that's where it's at right now if i can jump in and just add to that um two thoughts so you know talking about the the, the trans woman being the kind of horizon of hatred i i think that that is true in in putin's case and the kind of audiences he's addressing but i think what's interesting is if you look in turf you know, world, it's it's actually the trans man who's the kind of bloody shirt. Um, uh, there's so much anxiety, uh, you know, because a lot of these TERFs are, are kind of lesbian feminists, and it kind of gets fed into this anxiety about, like, the death of the lesbian, and there's no more lesbian bars, and nobody's a lesbian anymore, all the butches are becoming, you know, are transitioning, and, you know, so it's it's interesting um, how the, the figure of the trans man um, operates there. And then with regard to why trans issues are at the forefront um, or become moving to the forefront um, in the Eastern European context, they've also moved to the forefront in the, in the context that I'm studying, um, the American context. And I think it has something to do with, with what Professor Graf said about um, in cultures where homophobia is sort of um, less pronounced than maybe it was in epochs past, um, the trans person becomes a way to activate some of those same anxieties. But I think it's also, um, in the US context, it's the perfect wedge issue. It divides the progressive coalition. Um, it divides the Democratic Party's coalition. Um, and so there's like real electoral gains to be made by exploiting this issue. And then I also think, and this, this may be true in the Eastern European context as well as in the American context, um, Transness, it, it it fits neatly. I, I should say anxiety about transness fits neatly with like anxieties about national boundaries. And, you know, it's like we have to like defend the boundaries of the nation and 
to do that, we have to defend the boundaries between the sexes. And there's this, you know, I think there's like a deep affinity and resonance there that in a way makes it even more potent than the homophobic stuff, you know? Um, so those, those are my thoughts. Oh, are there questions from the floor? Oh, we'll, we'll people down on the floor? Uh, to, uh, yeah, sure. We can we can take another web question. Um, we have one uh, regarding a religion, um, and this question reads: Speaking of religion, um, have any of the speakers looked at religions beyond Christianity and how they operate within? in parallel or in opposition to the anti-gender movement? So something of a comparative um, religious question. I can I can make a footnote, maybe not a full-fledged argument. Um, the opposition to gender in the early 90s or in the mid 90s when, it, when this thing started actually connected uh, the Vatican to um, uh, Muslim countries uh, the the coalition was in, in involved um uh, saudi arabia and some other countries and the the one of the first books uh written about this phenomenon was actually i don't remember the title the, na the name of the author is bob and it employs this really catchy phrase the baptist burqa network or the baptist burqa coalition so this was a time when um muslims and radical catholics and uh, evangelicals actually collaborated actively but by the late 90s when the world congress of families was set up the muslims were already out and of course after that you get 9 11 and transphobia uh, and um, um, islamophobia becomes one of the core themes of the anti-gender argument so the muslims are out however the jews are in in some bizarre ways that i haven't really traced but uh, one, one very interesting uh, moment is when um i think it's 2012 uh, when um, uh, Pope Benedict writes his big, biggest uh, letter about the dangers of gender, he actually quotes the head rabbi of France. And the head rabbi of France is quoting Simone de Beauvoir. So it's this weird kind of, you know, but then I think the you know the, the the there isn't any big Jewish contingent at these events. It, they really are a coalition of different Christians, and I would say that right now, there there is a the the Catholics are still going very strong. Evangelicals are providing a lot of the money and the know how. A lot of these campaigns are actually modeled on. Um, 1980s uh, American campaigns, and they they know it. They I mean they do workshops on how this is done. And I wouldn't underestimate the importance of the Russian Orthodox Church in this. And one of the reasons why uh, the so well-loved uh, Pope Francis is so um, engaged in um, uh, demonizing gender while making these, these arguments for gay rights that, that gay people really love, but they don't go very far these arguments by the way but the but gender is the colonization said um uh, said pope francis one of the reasons he says this and he repeats it as international context is that it is a platform with patriarch kirill and uh, you know the theologians and historians of the catholic church have argued that one of the big games that is being played by the catholic church uh, right now um and is the reason why the Pope has not been fast to condemn Putin is that he really wants to go to Russia and, you know, hold hands with Kirill. And gender is the platform for that. So I would say it is a very broad coalition of ultra conservative Christians. With Muslims being mobilized occasionally, especially in Britain, and especially in campaigns against sex education, there were several campaigns where, uh, where um, um, Muslims were targeted as parents in, in a kind of moral panic. But I, I don't see them as key players in, in these movements. Um, one thing I wanted to just open the possibility of we didn't give you really a chance to ask questions or draw links between your own papers, if that's 
<laughs> we kind of rushed right into questions and uh, uh, usually that is an opportunity that, that comes with being on the panel. And I think it'd be really interesting to hear where you were particularly uh, finding connections between your, your work or, or, or not connections, com conflicts or contradiction between your own work. Uh, so anybody can start who would like to, but I can also just- uh, we, we do have a couple of questions from, from the audience. Um, so perhaps we'll take those and we can- Okay, um, sure. Build that together with a, with a comparative uh, question between papers as well. So okay. I've got a plug and a question. The plug is um, riffing off of Lorna's uh, response that maybe instead of just looking to uh, be the future, we could also re uh, characterize ourselves as the real traditionalists. And that's one of the things I've tried to do in the work I've done on the Vatican and gender ideology and its plugging of complementarity by saying that gender ideology is the uh, New Testament. I mean, what, what what's demonized as gender ideology is positively uh, the theology of the Catholic Church in the New Testament and all the way through the Middle Ages and sexual complementarity is an invention of the second half of the 20th century. Um, the, my question is for Agnieszka and it um, is will be of great help to me in my presentation this afternoon. Can you say more about how Ukraine fits into your East and West divide in the sense that Ukraine is um, East of all of the countries you specifically um, mentioned as having uh, these campaigns uh, and west of Russia. And instead of being colonized, it is affirmatively without, as far as I can tell, colonization seeking to move west and embracing um, gender rather than embracing anti gender. Um, I'm, Sorry, I'm not before sure. You respond, I am... We'll also take a, uh, one other question in the audience from um, uh, Srimati Basu. Um, and that question was from uh, Professor uh, uh, Mary Ann Case. My apologies. So, should I answer or are we taking another question? I'm sorry, I'm a little lost here. Yeah, you should answer that question. Okay. Um, uh, hi, thank you for such an excellent start. Um, I think, in, in the spirit of what uh, Deborah was asking, I actually have. Um, a couple of questions across some of the panels. So um, one is maybe on race and also colonialism. I was really interested in how differently that the question of colonialism is evoked in each of these, like Eastern Europe sees itself as colonized as opposed to, you know, um, let me say actual colonization. Um, <laughs> by European powers. I, I mean, I think it's mobilized as a discourse really interestingly. Um, but, um, and Sharmila, I, uh, one of the things about, you know, so um, I grew up in India, I, I work on India for my research. And so one of the things uh, there is um, um, the quite good use of the human rights framework by, you know, groups that identified as queer across uh, various things, but it's also a very uh, kind of a class discourse, right? But trans groups, right, are often um, face much more precarity, much more, you know, they're not seen in that certain kind of way. So I'm, I'm really interested in how that uh, goes in the Philippines. And finally, Lorna, I love, I love uh, thinking with embarrassing feminists really one of my very favorite things. And um, I just thought um, that Budhal seems a, a super interesting figure for, um, I like to teach with Alexandra Kollontai's work, right? For example, which raises a lot of the uh, similar issues. So that the timeline is really interesting in how both she thinks about sex work and about marriage in those things. Or, you know, uh, someone like Shulamit Firestone, who is a very classic 70s person, but challenges motherhood as a um, certain sort of discourse. What I find really, um, I mean, this doesn't surprise me as a, you know, white woman who moves to England, you know, all, that is how um, tone deaf it is to the form. I mean, that this is its problem in mobilizing it, right? How tone deaf it is to, um, Black mothers in the US, for example, 
to whom it's a privilege to it's to who you know so everything about her discourse of motherhood seems very like essentially middle class white woman -y, you know And I will have much more to say on human rights and its uses and abuses this afternoon. So I, I guess it's my turn to 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 respond to Marian Case. Um, it's great to to hear you again. I've been rereading your papers on the Vatican recently. Um, the, the the question of whether Eastern Europe belongs to the West is precisely the question that is at stake in these debates. In other words, gender is a code term used by people like Orban and Kaczynski uh, to signify um, the, the need to withstand Western influence. And of course, the, the ultimate political goal is to withdraw from the European Union. The problem is for those political players that, that the, the populations of these countries do not want to leave the European Union. Right. They do not want to condone that plan. And so it has to be reframed in a way that will resonate with the populations. And that's the anti-gender rhetoric. Um, they, they have a pretty tough game to play because they cannot admit to being, uh, you know, to, to pushing Poland into the arms of Vladimir Putin, which in, is increasingly becoming evident with, uh, you know, I don't know if anyone is following Polish politics, but there, there's a huge scandal regarding how Kaczynski and Law and Justice got into power, and it's through these tapes that were actually, um, you know, made by the, by the Russian um uh, by Russian agents, and well, it's a complicated story. But the point is that the that the, the illiberal parties, which are using anti-gender rhetoric in the region, are actually anti-EU parties operating in a largely pro-EU environment and winning because they have been persistently associating the European Union with these, you know, outrages of gender. So while 80% of the Polish population uh, believes that Poland should stay in the EU no matter what. You also have polls which say that almost 40% of Polish population believes that there is a gender conspiracy, right? So that that that's where the game is at. I don't know if that answers your question. I would say we are, you know, we are the buffer zone in many different ways. And, you know, from, from, from their point of view, it's like, you know, the, the place where Christendom is supposed to be defended. And from Western Europe's point of view, it's that part of Europe where liberal democracy didn't take for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, we're, we're not as secure in our belonging to the West as we were a decade ago, certainly. And gender has done the the anti gender campaigns were the tool in achieving that goal by the illiberal right, illiberal illiberal right. Can I can I go ahead and and respond? Yeah. So I I love this phrase thinking with embarrassing feminists as a way to kind of describe my career and you know my vocation. Um, uh, that's delightful. Um, with regard to the specific way in which Woodhull is embarrassing that you rightly pointed out, right? There, there's no question um, that Woodhull's analysis is sort of rooted in um, uh, uh, a myopic <laughs> uh, preoccupation with like the the problems facing bourgeois white women at the time. Um, th th there's no arguing that. Um, th you know, I would say by like, you know, the standards of the time she lived, you know, like her anti-racism amounted to a kind of abolitionism um, and uh, kind of support for the the radical Republicans um, and, a, and a deep sense of disappointment, disaffection um, that that party was sort of drifting away um, from, you know, its its commitments to reconstruction and things like that. Um, but yeah, she does not have like a, a thoughtful, um, engaged analysis of like, the dilemmas and and obstacles uh, black mothers at the time are confronting. There's there's no doubt. What I will say, you know, I don't know if this is like in her defense or um, whatever, but her one thing that she she does um, speak to are all the ways in which um, the kind of extant uh, patriarchal 
familial arrangement and the way it sort of articulates with capitalism was making it impossible for women to care for their children properly, right? Uh, white women, rich women, and she doesn't name it, but I think, you know, also black women, right? And I think that there's real, um, in our moment, right, uh, kind of anti-racist intersectional feminist power in, in that, right? That, that the status quo is an obstacle to the fulfillment of our, as Woodhull would put it, kind of maternal duties, um, and therefore to uh, live up to our, our kind of mandate as mothers, we have to make it so that the social supports are in place to make uh, the, the rearing of, of children into democratic citizens viable, right? So, you know, again, like that, that not a defense of Woodhull, but just a, a way in which I think that her prescriptions could speak to some of um, the the problems and dilemmas that subsequent Black feminists um, have have kind of put their finger on. So that's that's how I'll respond to that. We have uh, one more question from uh, Professor uh, Susan Gale. Oh, oh Sharmila. Yes. Yeah. So just a very quick one about timelines and temporality. I, I will say that uh, the LGBT movement in the Philippines actually makes use of this by saying queer is not the future, queer is actually our past. And I want to share with you, I'll keep this short, I want to share with you um, some links to that. So our most famous um, LGBT student organization, and they are quite uh, influential, is, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to share it on, the, on this chat, UP Babaylan. Oh, I'm unable to paste anything. But anyway, uh, UP Babaylan, so they, um, named themselves after the figure of a, a shaman in pre-colonial Philippines that often crossed genders. And in some, in some interpretations would actually be too spirit or just fluid and ambiguous. Um, and so the argument is queer is, has always been here and is being erased. Mm -hmm. may, may I ask a question for Lorna? I don't know if there's- Sorry, we'll, we'll take um, okay. Professor Gal's question. around is that is yeah. that all right so i just it's odd it's odd to be uh, I, did, I did press on it's on so um i want it's odd to be thanking you while showing you my back but i guess you're actually seeing my friend um so i want to thank you all because it was a really um provocative and uh thought-provoking set of um of discussions and i want to just throw something on the table um because i think the notion of motherhood and the recuperation or perhaps um what whatever the word you want to use um it never went away um uh, but the but the va revalorization of uh of motherhood um is uh is a really important thought and i'd like to put the notion of nature um, on the table and this comes both from the organizers of, of our conference uh, but also uh, from the Hungarian um, situation which is quite similar to what Agnieszka um, discussed but has a little um, added um, uh, sense that that it's nature that the illiberalism is, re is, is um, reinserting into the colonizing um, uh, attempts of the of the EU, and I think that this is very important because um, this is something that um, people who are not uh, much involved in politics at all and not um, and not involved in questions of uh, mobilization for or against, so not even parental movements, are very sensitive to nature and even people who are not religious, which is very common in Hungary. Uh, non-religion, um, but they're very sensitive to the notion of what is natural and what is not natural. And I think this is something that need, we need to discuss and um, and in many ways um, recast, um, respond to. So thanks again. I just wanted to say we have, um, we're, we're already running over time. Um, so if we can um, have just brief responses uh, for about five, five minutes total.
I am not sure. <laughs> What did I say? Um, Lorna or Agnieszka, can you hear us? Um, would you? Yes, we can. Would you like to respond? Um, sure. Briefly? I, I, I would like to respond on, on briefly the question of nature or, yes, to the sorry. nature question. I absolutely agree. Um, I think there, there are two parts to that work that needs to be done. One is to actually examine closely the abuse of the term nature that happens in the anti-gender discourse. Um, that's, a, that's a paper, if not book, waiting to be written on how they actually move smoothly um, between natural law, which is a theological concept, very dodgy one, in, um, in dogmatic Catholicism to nature understood as, you know, that, that thing that birds and bees do and we should follow in their footsteps because everything else is counter to biology, right? And that I think that elision is really powerful and it works wonders. And um, it's also interesting how I ideas about nature, really bizarre ones are being taken up uh, by the misogynistic movements today. This idea of the sexual market, of, um, you know, of women, uh, well, the sex is competing for each other and how um, I think that needs to be untangled um, in terms uh, intellectually. That we need to see that they've that that this idea of natural family, for instance, is completely, you know, to be abolished. But the other side of the work is, you know, where do we come in with the term nature? And I think that is very clearly an alliance with um, the with contemporary version of environmentalism. In other words, the, the the climate change movement. I think you know when you talk when I talk to my students about these issues, for them climate change is really the big issue that they that they are involved in and it's very clear that these two catastrophes that are looming on the horizon are are actually in competition for young people's imagination right so if if you look at and their their polls confirming this that that young people who vote for the extreme left uh, for, for the left and 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 extreme left tend to believe that catastrophe is coming from climate and people who vote for the the right tend to believe that it's the catastrophe of gender and collapse of the gender binary and I think you know we need to speak to these concerns and to these competing discourses um you know claiming reclaiming the the queer climate change language and I would go in that direction strategically but also intellectually so I've, I've been reading a lot of Donna Haraway and thinking about mushrooms and their queerness thank you and I, I'm sorry I know we don't have time for this but maybe Lorna can answer me in an email I wonder if in your thinking about reclaiming of motherhood for feminism you've been looking at abolitionists this is something that you know I always struck me when I teach American you know the his, 19th century history on how the idea of the slave mother was actually completely central to abolitionism and you know the, the, there were a lot of women who were also feminists making that argument and I wonder if there is a genealogy that to be tapped into or whether you think that's kind of irredeem irredeemably um, paternalistic or maternalistic but yeah that's the sojourner truth connection I guess yeah yeah um a, a few thoughts so on this question of nature um I'm, I'm going to be bold and kind of speak for my co-author because this is like her contribution or one of her contributions to this project um she's thinking through like Phyllis Schlafly's uh you know, positive woman and how it, um, you know, the, the roots of the kind of articulation of motherhood and the Moms for Liberty type groups is ultimately, uh, you know, owes a debt to, to Schlafly's uh, mother as positive woman kind of trope. And one of the points she makes that I think is really like smart and insightful is um, the, the, like there's enormous appeal to Schlafly's like way of talking about motherhood because it's really I, I've never, I'm not a mother I've never been a mother but it looks really hard um, and what Schlafly does um, is like say look like yeah I know you feel like it's hard and you feel like you're not doing it right but this is in your nature right um, so just like get in touch with those maternal instincts and like let that flow and like it'll happen for you that's like a really seductive promise and so um then Anna connects that to this like 
kind of discourse about motherhood um, that I wouldn't have thought of as Schlafly until she pointed it out to me. But this like kind of she calls it Gaia feminist way of talking about motherhood, like, um, you know, like goddess worship stuff and, um, you know, th that also like mobilizes that idea of like the naturalness of 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 motherhood for for women and ultimately like we acknowledge like the the the, the role that plays in kind of reassuring and, and providing some solace to women or you know mothers as they bear the burdens of of that role but ultimately we kind of think it's a dead end um you know so we're i think what we're trying to do is actually break that connection between I, ideas of the natural and uh ideas of the mother. Um, and we want to argue actually being a mother is like social labor <laughs> um, and that requires social um, support and solidarity. And um, it's something that we have to deliberately, you know, like build and construct and create. It's not just going to happen, right, um, in a kind of laissez-faire, invisible hand, natural kind of way. Um, so those are my thoughts. And then, um, Professor Graf, um, I didn't, I wasn't taking notes because I was so wrapped up in what you were saying. And now I've like blanked on what the you were asking. The slave mother yes. as a figure yes. in abolitionist movement. Th there, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that reminder. Yeah. So um, yeah, like it, there's no doubt that like, um, it, it's kind of like the way that um, the, the um, trope of the prostituted woman um, figures in, um, you know, kind of, I guess, I think of like Andrea Dworkin or, you know, Catherine McKinnon, her contemporary anti-trafficking um, discourse, like that was kind of, I think of as a parallel to the role that the slave mother, like as like the the symbol for like the the most egregious, most exploitative aspect of um, slave power um, was the way in which uh, it, it, it uh, you know, stole the kind of maternal capacities away from enslaved women. Um, and I think that Woodhull is like probably influenced by that, you know, figure. And it's helpful um, for me to, to think of that because she was involved in abolitionism and um, she does, you know, make point to exactly that kind of trope and that kind of image. Um, and she compares marriage um, to, to slavery for just this reason um, that it, that it uh, alienates women um, from their kind of maternal capacity and 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 steals uh in fundamental ways like their their kind of children and their um you know so yeah so anyway uh that's like a productive affinity there thank you very much i'm really sorry i have to end this uh this panel and uh i'll see you all in 10 minutes right i think